I set a challenge for myself. Can I remake my YouTube intro using free software? Let's give it a shot. Hey guys, it's Cindy Kupantua, and today I'm just gonna talk about how I remade my YouTube opening for the second time, meaning that there's three versions of this thing. I kind of had an idea of what I wanted this third version to look like. I wanted it to look like it was coming from either a miniature set, it had some CG, and it was very minimalistic, simple, all that jazz. But one thing I wanna try is to make it all using free software. For the last two versions of the opening, I used Flash, or also known as Adobe Animate, to animate the characters, to color them, and to ink them. The backgrounds were done in Photoshop, and I composited it all together using After Effects. Now the reason why there's a huge jump from 2015 to 2016 in terms of look and quality was because the 2015 was just made casually, it was just made just to test the grounds of what this YouTube channel would have been. I just created the mascot at the time. So the designs were super early. Now the second version, I spent a lot more time with. I made a whole process video, a tutorial course based off it, where it came from thumbnailing to planning and to actually animating. You can actually find that in the Gumroad store. But for the third version, there is a specific look that I'm going for, and I've always wanted to learn more about Blender and Grease Pencil, so I decided to use Blender and its Grease Pencil. A few years ago, I did a video of me using Blender and using Grease Pencil. And my honest conclusion of Grease Pencil was something that I would probably not switch my choice of 2D animation software completely with Grease Pencil. And I have my own opinions about it. Like the biggest one was that drawing on it didn't feel good. Amongst other opinions that were considered standard in a lot of 2D animation software that I used that wasn't present in Grease Pencil, a lot of people thought that I was being biased, unfair, and that I hated Grease Pencil, which wasn't true. Kind of like how that one time I joked about Richard Williams and suddenly everyone thought that I hated Richard Williams, that I was disrespectful to the man. But to get so riled up and upset about software choice, I mean, come on. So I decided to hold off on the whole Grease Pencil stuff. But I have been using Blender for many purposes. I like Blender. I would say I'm a casual user of Blender. I can rotate stuff. I can just create simple things. I can just use it just for the sake of work. I experimented with 3D scans that I took from a park, put them in Blender and added my dancing dog animations in it. I played around with modeling and I used it for my layout passes for animation. Where if I just didn't want to paint the background or sketch a layout of the background, I could just model it and then paint over it sometime. But lately at work, we've been using Blender for 3D sets and stuff. Overall, it just added another layer of autonomy for my line of work. Whether it's storyboarding or animation, I feel a bit more powerful using Blender. Now, I tried making little animation tests using Grease Pencil a few times, and for me, it was always cumbersome because I would accidentally do things, some things wouldn't work unless I pushed a certain button. I mean, these are all technical stuff, but again, the biggest thing was that I just did not like drawing in it, especially with the pen pressure. It felt waxy. I've drawn in TV Paint, Clip Studio. They're great, but maybe I have to switch things up for me to actually feel like I'm using Grease Pencil to my advantage. So for my case, you know, I don't really care about line weight and all that stuff, especially if I just want to make casual things. So I usually just turn off the pen pressure for the size and the opacity, and then it feels quite decent. It took me a while to get used to the lines and the fill setting and the materials, but once you get used to it, it's actually pretty cool. I don't use the sculpt option as much, only for correcting drawings, but I don't really sculpt to like change the drawings during animation. Like just sculpting an arm instead of like redrawing it for animation. I haven't really done that. and every time I do, it looks stupid. But there's something cool about the Grease Pencil modifiers and effects that are pretty cool, and I'll get to that soon. But for me to be able to utilize Grease Pencil, something that I didn't really do as much is to adjust my shortcuts. Luckily, I have a Torbox peripheral here. It's like a little device with a bunch of buttons and widgets here and there. I use it for almost all of my programs. It made me faster. I can flip super fast. I can scroll through my frames. So I just had to adjust that with my Grease Pencil settings. And then now I have a bit more power with Grease Pencil. So the first thing I did was animate the dog. And before I animate, I always thumbnail. Thumbnailing is doing these series of little drawings just to sort of like brainstorm what the poses could be or the overall vibe and energy that I want. And I have to explore that before I animate. And I would get a clear picture of what my drawings would look like or what I want to pose out. Now I've seen people when they use grease pencil, they draw right on the 3D set, but I don't want to do that. I'm just going to animate with the preset 2D animation on Blender and just animate flat. And I can always import that into a 3D set later on. I kind of have an idea Idea of what I want. It doesn't really like move around the background as much, so I'm not really concerned about that. 
then I would animate really rough so it would look like a very sketchy flour sack with dotty eyes and just like indications of ears and stuff like that. I'll only maybe have a few key poses that look a bit more detailed. Everything else is just movement information. Sometimes I'll chart it out, sometimes I won't, but in most cases, I try my best not to in between my drawings here because I'm just gonna be wasting energy and I can save that on the clean lines. Then let's move on to the cleanup. So again, I'm just using a brush that has no pen pressure sensitivity on opacity and size. So I'm just gonna be drawing with a hard round brush, just like a good artist would in Photoshop and then just draw away. And you know, my cleanup is usually very wobbly. And sure, it could be my skills as a cleanup is lacking, but at the same time, I'm kind of just going through this fast because I just want to get it done. And I know super cleanup isn't really important to me. Now, before I would do the rough animation and I would do a rough tie down, but for this one, I've been trying to teach myself to do less steps. So just the rough animation and then just move on to cleanup immediately, just so that I can be more decisive in my lines. I can think more about my drawing. I can be a bit more bold, but if you want to for solid drawings, then I would recommend doing a rough tie down with solid primitives and then do the cleanup. But I'm just doing this just for the sake of myself. And I do want to explore the world of limited animation eventually. So less steps, baby. Now, the best advantage of vector programs for animation is that there's a lot more autonomy and modifications that you can make. So for example, in Grease Pencil's case, I could just change the color of my line art just by changing the settings of the color swatch. With raster-based programs, you kind of have to do this whole replace color filter thing or make the changes yourself by locking the alpha channel and stuff like that. Harmony, for example, if you use the pencil tool, you can change the line width, you can change the line style, which is all very cool. So here's the thing about color swatches and materials for a grease pencil. You can make a line material, which just draws lines, and then you can make a fill material, which is for like filling stuff in. They can even be both. So when you draw a shape, it's gonna draw both the line and fill it automatically. So just for the purpose of filling, you would just disable the line settings and then just have to fill only. And this is great for like creating shapes just in case you wanna fill those grommets of negative space. At first, I didn't really understand why this had to be, but the more I used Grease Pencil, the more I really appreciated it. And I think it's a great idea that they implemented. It was so useful that I looked at TV Paint and tried to find adjustments and settings that were quite similar. And luckily I found some of that. So the guys who did develop Grease Pencil, this one's a smart one. So I'm not gonna talk much about coloring because it's pretty much the same in how I color in let's say Adobe Animate or Toon Boom Harmony. It's just a paint bucket tool or sometimes I'd have to draw the fill myself. All I can say is this step is always really tedious and laborious. However, one thing that I failed to mention, and this is the biggest thing that would actually motivate me to switch to Grease Pencil completely, is Grease Pencil's summary keys. So a summary key basically groups the pencil lines, the colors, all under one key. So if I wanted to change the timing of the whole animation, I could just modify the summary keys. I don't have to move the color keys and the line keys independently and match them manually. The summary key basically groups them all together. So this is really good. I don't think I personally found anything like that in Toon Boom Harmony or TV Paint or even Flash, but as someone who wants to make independent stuff and I want to make them fast and using as little steps as possible, this would make me switch over, no lie. So in compositing, especially in After Effects, there's settings that you can add, like layer styles. You can add automated highlights, automated drop shadows, some interfills without having to draw them. Now, Grease Pencil has that, and the cool thing about this is that they can also interact with the light settings. So if you have, like, let's say, a rim light setting on the character, it'll change depending on where your light is in the scene or where your light source is in within the scene. But I will also say that there's still quite some limitations that I wish that they did work on, like the strength of these effects, the opacity of these settings because sometimes when I you know finagle with it sometimes it's too strong sometimes it's too weak there's no way to manually set it up where you can get just that right moment but you can get really cool imagery so sometimes I like to turn down the iterations or the passes to like maybe two or three and it makes things look a bit more stepped and a bit choppy which actually I kind of like the look it looks a bit more stylized I don't like things when they look too smooth for me so while I do think that it alone, the flat shades does look good, I'm gonna see what I can do with these automatic effects and shadows and things like that. I did have to sort of improvise. So some things that just were meant for like light settings, you know, I kind of reversed it. So the rim lights would be like drop shadows at one point or the inner shades of the character. Overall, I just spent a lot of time just playing around with it, finagling with it until I got an effect that looked interesting to me. And I will say, okay, now I'm ready to 
put this character into a 3D set. So let's do that. So now I'm ready to 3D model the background. Now the thing is that I did a bit of studies. I did studies of standing desks. I looked at old computers because I do want to have like an old Apple II looking computer just lying around. I kind of wanted to feel a bit retro. But something about studying and drawing the objects before 3D modeling them actually gives me an understanding of how I would approach modeling it, how I would plan modeling it, and understanding the thing in general. I even drew out some plants and figured out how I want the actual leaves to look like because the thing is I've decided I'm going to model all of this without complex shaders, without complex materials, or even textures. It's just going to be like a few solid colors, some light material properties like metallic reflection and all that, but at the end of the day, I'm keeping the shaders relatively simple. Now the thing that stopped me from actually pursuing 3D modeling with Blender is that I got so intimidated with the shaders and the materials, but I think that I should just enjoy 3D modeling the thing without worrying about UV mapping, texture coordinates, or all that stuff, which I've dabbled with previous experimentations, but I think for this one, I just want to treat it like Lego. Anyways, I started a new project file. I import the 2D animation from a different file, and now I have the grease pencil animation in this new project. And guess what? It reacts to light sources. But sadly, it still doesn't cast shadows. I think this is just a grease pencil thing that I have to accept. First, I modeled the desk, and it's really made of really simple boxes and cubes and six-sided cylinders. Very low poly stuff, nothing too complex. Honestly, I'm just using the BDSF, 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 I think, shaders, and I'm really just changing the color and just changing a bit of the properties. Then I would go on to model the plant. So first I modeled the pot, which is just another six-sided cylinder, and I extruded it, reversed it, created another hole within the pot, and then you can apply a different material to a certain face. This is something that's super useful. An object doesn't have to have one material shading, it can have multiple. You just select the sides and assign that material to that face. The leaves and plants themselves are just planes. I just modified the curvature, the, the overall shape. I just managed and manipulated some of the vertices. Then I would just duplicate the same leaf and kind of just like change the orientation and the rotation as I organize them differently. Now, I don't have a stem because you're not really going to see it. I just did some leaf rotation and hopefully that hides some of that trickery. Again, going for that minimalistic look. The same thing goes for that retro computer that I modeled, which is just a box that kind of looks like an Apple II. It's just a box with an extruded monitor. I modified it a bit and just assigned a different material to the screen, something that's reflective and very specular. And then really, I just added another little box to act as the power on and off button right on the front. As you can tell, my modeling skills are super rudimentary, but at the end of the day, I'm finding this a fun experience. On the desk, I decided to add another plane and I decided to add a little doodle using grease pencil. Now, for some reason, I don't exactly know why it's showing us this transparent stroke. I thought it was gonna be a hard round line, but maybe there's something that I failed to finagle with. But you know what? I'm just moving forward. I'll figure it out some other time. I modeled a little hexagon shaped carpet. It's really just a super flat cylinder that was preset with six sides, nothing special. The stool, the same story, a hexagonal seat followed along with some three cylinders and then at the bottom of it is this low poly torus. That's about like six sides too, maybe less, I can't remember. But again, simple, simple, simple. For the window, it's really just a Boolean operation. So what I did was I got a cube, I put it by the wall, and I did the whole Boolean modifier settings. And what that does, it's kind of like inverting things. So I'm using the box to basically cut a hole or shape within that wall. Now, something that I noticed is that even if you hide objects in the view, you will still see it as render. And this is something that you have to manually configure in the object setting, where you have to turn off its visibility when you actually render it. But now I want to see something outside of the house, maybe a landscape. Luckily, I think if you turn on a few add-ons in the Blender presets, there's a whole selection of meshes of landscapes. So you can select mountains, you can select valleys, and I just grabbed one of those and just slapped it on there and then gave it a green color. Then I go on to model the little doors of the windows, which is just really rotated small tiny rectangulars. So again, I'm not really too familiar with how the lights work. I'm pretty sure there's some like secret there, but I think for some cases I had to do things manually. So I would put a light source by the floor to make it seem like there's light bouncing in the room. By changing the world color from a muted blue to a more saturated teal, it did affect the colors of the shadows that is being portrayed in the room. It made the shadows a lot more tealer. I know I did a bunch of stuff like on-screen reflections, 
ambient inclusion, all the stuff using the radiance volume. This is just so that the shadows are a lot more baked in. And I even did adjust it so the shadows are a bit stronger. There's a lot of steps and experimentations that I did that it's kind of hard to summarize right now, but yeah, I was doing a lot of stuff to it. So I even cranked up the bloom settings, and what that is, is it, it kind of gives a radiance of things that are bright within the space. So if there's like a really light object, it'll emit a glow or bloom around it based on its highest values. And you can adjust this, the threshold, how hard it blooms, how big the bloom is, etc. I think it works well with the scene because it's now giving the impression that light is bouncing all over the place from the ground. Now I would switch back between two different renders, the EV and the Cycles. The EV is more of a real time engine and it gives cooler colors, where Cycles gave deeper colors, sometimes even warmer colors. Now I want the outside to be just a bit more interesting, maybe add a building there, so I just modeled a giant butt plug just sitting by the mountains. So now I'm going to do that whole donut sprinkle technique found in Andrew Price's donut tutorial it's a classic but you can use the particles and hair modifier to scatter objects that you made around a surface so i modeled a little rock and just sprinkled it all over the terrain giving it a sort of like we're on the alps kind of feel and here i'm just playing around with the lighting maybe there's light being blasted on the butt plug outside maybe there's more on the terrain kind of resembling like little clouds casting light but I just played around with the whole lighting. There's a lot of trickery because again, I'm pretty sure you can make this a lot more streamlined with lights, but my knowledge for that, I'm just improvising right now. And next I'm just playing with the camera animations. So will the camera rotate by the side of our Bon Bon character? Does it just drone in from behind? One important thing is that it has to stay focused on the character. I just don't know how much camera movement there should be. Don't make it too distracting, but don't also make it too mundane. And also, I kind of want to show the depth of the scene. You know, show a little bit of that butt plug rotating in space, parallax style. I even adjusted the depth of field, so it would mostly just focus on Bon Bon the dog, and everything else would be a bit more blurry. And you can adjust this, you can set the depth of field to focus on the character, and then everything around it will just be a little off focus. And you can adjust this to see how intense it is, how blurry it is. It gives that miniature dioramic look. Okay, next I'm playing around with lighting and I'm thinking what if the room was really dark at first and then as the animation goes on, the light from the floor would kind of just drone in, sort of like mocking that there's light being bounced in that time. And this is where I played around with the grease pencil effects on the dog itself. What's awesome is that the grease pencil reacts to light, so if there's no light, it's darker. And this also applies to the rim light settings that you have. So if you do have a rim light effect that's like acting as the highlight of the character, it won't display or it'll be as weak if the light source isn't there. Sometimes it would appear too dark for my taste. And what's cool about Grease Pencil is that you can actually change the settings whether it reacts to light or not. I turned off its reaction to light and it still seemed good but I don't think it had the warmth of the room itself, which I wanted to admit. Now the modifiers are great, the glow, the rim lighting, all that is great. I just wish that there was a setting where you can actually adjust the threshold or the opacity of these things. So it's not really a prisoner to the light settings or the scene itself. I want more control over that. Now from here on out, I'm really just playing around. I'm just changing the lightings, I'm just adjusting the lights, animating them, turning them off, turning them on. Really there's nothing point of interest here. I tried experimenting more with the camera movement where it starts really close to Bon Bon and then zooms out. But at the same time, when I looked at that, that felt way too much, too distracting for me. I'm cranking up the f-stop and the depth of field just so that it really does feel like we're looking at a miniature taken with like an analog camera, I don't know. Then I started to experiment with the compositing window in Blender and this is something that I've never used before so I just improvised it and just played around with it. It's node based, kind of like Toon Boom Harmony, but I can add post filtering effects like lens flares, change the color during render, the curves, the levels, the contrast. And I'm sure there's a lot of effects I haven't really played around with, but it's good to know that it's there and I can just render it without having to make those changes in a program like After Effects. And I've done multiple render passes, one without the effects, one with the effects, one rendered in cycles. That took almost two hours to render. Oh my God, I'm sticking with Eevee. But I do have to admit that I did cheat a bit with the look of this because I did go to Premiere and just change the color so it's a bit more pastel-y and added a distortion effect, but I'm pretty sure there are settings like that in Blender. It's just a last minute 
decision that I made while editing the video together. And now I'm pretty much wrapping up this new version of the opening. It's 3D, it's got a new character animation, it's got a new set. Now what's great is that I can always make changes on the fly, like if I don't like the textures of a wall for example or the floor, I can just change that and re-render it. It's super easy. And that's the benefit of using a program like Blender. Or the benefit of keeping all the steps in one program rather than segregate them into different programs like TV Paint for animation, Photoshop for backgrounds, After Effects for compositing. I just did everything in Blender and it just makes things easier. Second is that I do want to evolve this room over time. So let's say I accomplish something and I'm proud of it. I'll put a memorabilia of it on the walls. So an image texture with the poster of a thing that I just recently finished. Or maybe I collaborate with other YouTubers or artists. You know, maybe I'll keep a sculpted head of them or an action figure of them in the set. I think there's something fun and exciting seeing this room kind of grow over time and collecting all this memorabilia. Now I did a comparison with the first version, the second version, and this version, and I know I've gotten criticism. Some people think that it was a waste of time for me to remake this because they think the 2016 version is perfect. And you know what? They're totally entitled to their own opinion. When I remade it for the first time with the 2016 version, people didn't like the 2016 version and liked the 2015 version. So I think people just are not used to new things and suddenly they just get used to it. And I'm pretty sure there's debatable reasons of like why one is better than the other. I've heard arguments where it's just like, I'm not a fan of 3D, that's why I don't like the new version. They're just divided about the new character acting of the character. But the important thing is that I learned something out of it. I feel like I have a better understanding of Blender and Grease Pencil, and I'm generally happy with how it looks. And sure, I do understand with the criticisms where I could work more on the models and stuff like that. And you know, that'll probably come over time. Maybe I'll revisit it, make some changes and then update it. But updating this feels so much more doable and easier compared to the other versions, which I don't really have access to those files anymore. Well, the first one at least I don't have access to. But hey, the overall point of this video is I remade the opening for the second time using free software. Kind of, without the changes of Premiere, but most of it was done in one program that is completely free, and you can totally do it too. Will I still switch entirely to Grease Pencil? Eh, probably not, because the more I learned about Grease Pencil, I was also learning more about TV Paint, and I found some great features about that program I've never used before, I just discovered them, and they are great. So, that's the thing with programs. There's no right or wrong program to use, it's whatever feels good, whatever helps achieve your goals. I keep getting asked what software is the best one to use, and I hate answering those questions because it really comes down to preference. Does it hurt to try new software? Absolutely not. But I think the truth is that most of us just really use, let's say less than 50% of all the features that the program is capable of. And knowing more about the program inside out, knowing more about its features, you can basically make a film within that program without having other programs to make it. So this is something that is beneficial for people who want to make more indie stuff or who just want to whip out stuff and just put it out there without spending that laborious and taxing time of jumping between different software for different reasons. Anyways, that's all. Bye. Here's the new opening. Interested in learning hand-drawn animation or learning how to finish an animated shot from beginning to end? Have a look at the store where you'll find the complete introduction to 2D animation video course, tutorials, and other resources. Learn classical animation approaches, drawing, lectures, techniques, and other process videos. Visit the store through the link in the description below.